In a criminal case, the Crown must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the accused had the actus reus and mens rea to commit a crime. In response, the accused has a basic legal right to present a defense. There are three main arguments that an accused may use in his or her defense. They may deny committing the act, disputing the actus reus. They may argue that they lacked intent, disputing the mens rea, and attempt to justify why they committed the act. There are several different legal defenses that are available to a criminally accused persons. Some of the common ones are alibi, automatism, intoxication, self-defense, battered woman syndrome, necessity and duress, mistake of fact, entrapment, double jeopardy, or provocation. The definition of the alibi defense is to argue that the accused was not at the scene of the crime when it took place and therefore could not have committed the crime. A complete alibi must include three components. A statement by the accused claiming they were not present at the crime scene when the crime was committed, an explanation of where they were, and names of any witnesses who can confirm the alibi. In order for an alibi to be considered strong, all three components must exist. If a full and reliable alibi can be presented, this is the strongest defense an accused person can use and it will likely lead to an acquittal. Alibis generally become weak when there are no witnesses to verify the claims made by the accused. If one or more of the three basic components is missing, it becomes easier for the Crown to raise doubts about the alibi's credibility. Automatism is an involuntary action by a person who cannot control his or her actions and who is in a state of impaired consciousness. Automatism can be divided into two types, insane and non-insane. Various factors can influence automatistic behavior, from sleepwalking, the consumption of drugs and alcohol, to a disease of the mind. Insane automatism is linked to a disease of the mind. If it can be proven that the accused person suffered from a mental disorder and as a result was incapable of knowing that what he or she was doing was wrong, the accused may be declared not criminally responsible. For example, a person with paranoid schizophrenia murders someone he or she wrongly believes is a threat. Due to this person's mental condition, he or she cannot truly appreciate that his or her action was wrong and can be found not criminally responsible. He or she may be referred for treatment instead of prison. The not criminally responsible defense may be raised by the Crown or the defense, but whoever raises it must prove it in court. Before a not criminally responsible case can be brought to court, the accused must be deemed fit to stand trial. A fitness hearing asks, does the accused understand the nature of the proceedings? In other words, does the accused understand that he or she is on trial? Does the accused understand the possible consequences of a trial? For example, prison or psychiatric care. Is the accused able to communicate with his or her lawyers? If an accused person is deemed unfit to stand trial, he or she may be sent back to prison or more likely a psychiatric facility until he or she is deemed fit for trial. If a trial proceeds and the accused is declared not criminally responsible for the crime, a provincial review board decides on the sentence. If the review board decides the accused is no longer a threat to the public, he or she may be discharged back into society. If the accused is still considered a threat, he or she is referred for treatment and the case is reviewed annually. Non-insane automatism is often referred to as temporary insanity. An accused person who uses this defense argues that he or she committed a crime while in a temporary state of impaired consciousness. Canadian courts have recognized that a person may enter such an impaired state as a result of any of the following. A physical blow, sleepwalking, consuming drugs, a stroke, severe psychological trauma, and other physical ailments, for example, hypoglycemia. Example, 
While sleepwalking, a man murders his wife. After he wakes up, he has no recollection of doing so. Even though he was walking and blinking, he was not aware of what he was doing when he committed the murder. If the accused is using an intoxication defense, he or she must demonstrate that he or she did not have a guilty mind at the time of the crime because he or she was intoxicated, most likely drugs and or alcohol. Intoxication may be used as a partial defense. Generally, an intoxicated person cannot form specific intent, but may be found guilty of a general intent offense. If successful, this defense can lower a conviction or reduce a criminal sentence. For example, if an intoxicated person severely assaults someone, he or she avoids being charged with aggravated assault because he or she did not endanger the person's life knowingly. But the accused may still be convicted of a lesser assault charge. Self-defense is the legal use of reasonable force in order to defend yourself and your property. The criminal code allows people to use force if they have to defend themselves, but the amount of force should not be excessive, no more than necessary. The use or exchange of force must be reasonable. Example, a person being attacked with a weapon may use a weapon to defend him or herself. Battered woman syndrome is a psychological condition caused by severe and usually prolonged domestic violence. The Supreme Court first recognized this defense in the precedent-setting case R v. Lavallee, 1990, as an extension of self-defense. The main difference between battered woman syndrome and the traditional definition of self-defense is the issue of imminent danger. In a typical self-defense case, the danger is immediate. With battered woman syndromes, the danger may not be immediate, but instead is constant. Queen v. Lavallee. This case established the battered woman syndrome defense in Canada. Angelique Lavallee was in an abusive relationship. One night she shot her partner in the back of the head as he was leaving a room. She testified that he told her he would come back and kill her later that evening. She believed him and was also able to prove that he had physically abused her for many years. The Supreme Court found it was reasonable for Lavallee to use lethal force in this situation, even though her partner was leaving the room. When using the defense of necessity, the accused person claims they were forced to commit a criminal act because they were in danger themselves. The Supreme Court has ruled that this defense may only be used in situations where there appears to be imminent risk. For example, a man speeds to get his wife to a hospital because she's in labor. If he's pulled over by a police officer for dangerous driving, he can try to argue that he is speeding out of necessity. Duress is when someone is threatened or coerced to do something against his or her will. Duress is similar to necessity defense. In both defenses, the accused claims to have been forced to commit a crime as a result of being in imminent danger. The main difference is that with duress, the accused is forced to act as the result of a threat. For example, Doug shoots someone and tells Eric that he must help him dump the body. When Eric refuses, Doug points his gun at him, which compels Eric to cooperate. The mistake of fact defense shows a lack of mens rea due to an honest mistake. Ignorance of the law or not knowing a particular offense was illegal is not a valid defense. Ignorance of the facts or not understanding all of the details of a situation can be used as a defense. For example, someone receives counterfeit money as change. Unknowingly, he or she attempts to use the fake money somewhere else and is caught. The accused knows that counterfeit money is illegal, but truly does not know he or she possessed fake money. The entrapment defense alleges that police's action induces a person to commit a crime. 
if a police officer coerces or forces a person to commit a crime, the officer is guilty of entrapment. If the accused can prove the police led him or her to participate in a crime, the court can dismiss the charges immediately. Example. Jimmy is continually harassed by an undercover police officer to purchase illegal drugs. If Jimmy can convince the court that he would not have purchased the drugs without the undercover's if Jimmy can convince the court that he would not have purchased the drugs without the undercover officer's forceful encouragement, he can claim the officer entrapped him. Double jeopardy is being tried twice for the same offence, which is generally not allowed in Canada. Section 11 of the Charter states that anyone charged with or acquitted of an offence cannot be tried for it again. This defense is usually presented as a pre-trial motion. Autrefora acquit accuses the accused claims that he or she was already acquitted, not found guilty, of the charges. Autrefo convict accused claims he or she was already convicted, that is, found guilty of the charges. The provocation defense is used when a person is provoked to lose their self-control and as a result commits the crime. Provocation can be used as a partial defense to justify the accused actions. For example, Andy is at a bar with his wife one night when another man insults his wife. Andy then assaults the man in a rage and causes significant bodily harm. Andy can use provocation as a defense and claim that if the man had not insulted his wife, he in turn would not have committed the assault that evening. 